Would you join me in turning in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6? In Mark chapter 6, we'll be looking at the first six verses there. And in Mark, what, what we've been seeing over the last couple of chapters here, between chapter 4 and chapter 5, between the, the, the parables that Jesus taught and then the miracles that he performed, there's this ongoing contrast of faith and faithlessness. As we look in particularly at the, uh, the, the miracles, the, the demoniac, what we, what we see from the demoniac? We saw faith as he came running down the mountainside through the, through the tombs to Jesus. We saw his faith. As we saw the uh, Jairus uh, coming to, get, to Jesus to, to get healing for his daughter, he came in faith. As the, the woman with the condition of bleeding, we see faith. We go back. What was the first miracle? The first miracle was Jesus calming the sea. What did he say to them? Have you still no faith? And as we make our way here to the first six verses of chapter six, we see yet more faithlessness. Faith seems to come in the expected place, or unexpected places and faithlessness in yet unexpected places also. We're places where you would expect to see the faith. But won't jump the gun. Let's go ahead and uh, if you're able to stand, I invite you to do so as we read these first six verses here in chapter six. He, Jesus, went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of Joseph and uh, Joseph, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went among the villages teaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we plead before you, Lord, that you would minister to us today. Lord, that you're... Holy Spirit would move in us, that it would open our eyes. Lord, you would open our eyes that we might see and understand the truths of your word. Lord, thank you for your word that reveals, that teaches us about who you are, about what you've done for us, Lord, about who we are. Lord, I pray that we would have eyes to hear, or eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, that you would... Um, Bless this time in your word. Lord, I feel un unfit, unworthy to be your messenger. But Lord, I know that the, the authority and the power of the message is not based on anything of myself. But it is based entirely on, on your authority and the authority of the word of God. So Lord, I pray that you'll move in and among us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the outline really for, uh, for this message is, is we're going to look more thoroughly at what's going on in these six verses. And then we're going to have a question and then a concern. That'll kind of be the, the three-part outline of, of the way we make our way through this. But in the, in the last few chapters, Jesus has has been on the go, as you may have noticed. One of the most used words in the whole gospel of Mark is immediately. <laughs> it's a quick moving, quick moving gospel. Jesus is always on the go. Things are always happening. In the last few chapters, we've seen Jesus teaching in Galilee there in Capernaum, got on a boat, went off to the other side. Not too long after he, he got there, healed the demoniac, came, came back from 
Gentile territory, healed Jairus' daughter, healed the, the woman with the condition of, of bleeding. And, and now Jesus is headed back to Nazareth. Nazareth. And Scripture says that it is his hometown. He came to his hometown. Maybe you're hearing that and you're thinking, well, wasn't Jesus born in Bethlehem? Well, yes, he was. Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem, according to uh, the census that was being taken at the time. Joseph and Mary, you remember, had to, to go to Bethlehem to be, to be registered. And so that's why Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And maybe you, when you think of your, your hometown, maybe you're thinking of where you live now. Jesus is living in Capernaum, but, but Jesus' hometown is Nazareth. That's where he grew up. That's where his parents lived. That's where he spent some 30 years of his life growing up there. Now, Nazareth is not a large town, smaller than Capernaum. It's about 25 miles southwest of the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum. And, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you're from a small town too. My, my hometown is a small town. It was about 600 people is the, the last that I knew. And so it's a little bit bigger than Nazareth was at that time. Nazareth, the, the size of the city was no longer than, no bigger than 60 acres, just a, a small place on the side of a rocky cliff. But if you're from a small town or if you've been around a small town, you sometimes know how small towns can be. Everybody knows everybody, don't they? And everybody knows everything about everybody, even things that aren't even true about everybody. They seem to know about them. Well, this is kind of the small town that Jesus grew up in. Little town of Nazareth, 500 some odd people. Small town where everybody knew everybody. He had grown up there, spent 30 years of his life there. He learned a trade from his father there. This is where he grew up going to synagogue. This is where all of his family still resides. His mother, his brothers, and his sisters, which are listed by name in here. And as Jesus was in the habit of doing, on the Sabbath day, he met uh, in the Lord's house. He met in the synagogue for worship. Being the Lord of the Sabbath, he met for worship on the Sabbath. Even Jesus found it important to meet for worship on the Sabbath. I think we ought to as well. But on this occasion, Jesus... He didn't sit out in the congregation like he probably had so many other times before. He didn't sit and listen to another rabbi as he had done as a child or as a young man. This time, Jesus is in the synagogue, probably where he grew up, and he is the one doing the teaching. Well, back in chapter 1, verse 22, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue a different time. And it says that he taught as, as one with authority, that he healed a man with an unclean spirit. And the response of the people is that they were astonished at his teaching. They were amazed at his power. And here, as, as Jesus teaches in the synagogue again, there is astonishment at his teaching and his wisdom. They are amazed by the works of his hands. But it is a different situation here in Nazareth than it was the last time that he was teaching. So the difference between chapter 1 and here in chapter 6, where Jesus is in Nazareth, is that the astonishment has more to do with who's doing the teaching than what's, what the content of the teaching is. It's more about who's doing the teaching than what's being taught. You see, these people had heard rabbis teach before on many different occasions. Um, Jesus... This, this man that they had, had watched grow up, he, he taught with more authority than any other scribe, any other rabbi that they had heard come through that synagogue. And this Jesus, this man who they just heard teach, he's no distinguished scholar. He's no distinguished rabbi. He was a mere carpenter. He had no training. He had no credentials. He was educated at home. But yet, how could this be? This Jesus, this normal guy, this guy that they had watched grow up. How could he, this Jesus of Nazareth that, that they saw, they maybe were around when his diapers were being changed. How could he, of all people, teach like this? Well, they didn't understand that the one before them then was no ordinary man. He was the Word of God incarnate. He was the God-man, the eternal Son of God. This was not any ordinary rabbi, any ordinary person coming in to teach in the synagogue that day. But this is somebody that they thought was ordinary. 
And so what we see from them is some contempt. If, if you read back through verses 2 and 3, and you kind of put a little bit of slant on the, on the reading, we don't, we don't know how it was said, but, but maybe they said it this way. Where did this man get these things? Where, what is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? And so in verse 3, we see exhibit A of the contempt of the people there in Nazareth. And they said, is not this the carpenter? Isn't this the carpenter? Notice they didn't say the son of the carpenter, as if to say, well, we, know his, we knew his dad. No, they say, isn't this the carpenter? As if to say, we know this guy. We know this Jesus. We, we, they'd seen him at work. Jesus is, is, was a carpenter. And carpenter, the word for carpenter is, is, is tecton. It's a word that can be translated to mean carpenter, but also a stone worker or a stone mason or really anybody who builds. And this is the word from which we get the, the word architect. And Jesus likely worked not only with his wood, but with, with stones, given the landscape of Nazareth. It's this rocky, rocky place. And so Jesus is one that they had seen at work. One, one unfamiliar with the Bible might look at the Gospels and think that Jesus was, was kind of a mooch, that he never worked a day in his life, that he traveled with these guys and went from house to house. But Jesus was a hard worker. He knew what it was to work. He worked with his hands. He worked as to the Lord and not unto man, as we are to do. But once his ministry began, he, he left that behind and focused on the task at hand. You see, he only had a certain amount of time to do what he had come to do. And he knew as soon as he started preaching that message that the people would be out to get him. So he focused on the task at hand. But, but back to the people in the synagogue, they thought, isn't this just the, the carpenter? He didn't belong in the synagogue teaching us. Who does he think he is? You kind of hear the, the pride and the disdain in their voices. Maybe they're saying, this man used to be below us in status. Just a carpenter, a man that worked with his hands. And now he's, now he's teaching us with more authority than anybody that we've ever heard. And well, they didn't want to hear it. They did not want to hear it. And as... Uh, verse 3 goes on. We kind of get exhibit B of the contempt of these people in Nazareth. Notice what they say next. Is this not the son of Mary? The son of Mary. Why would they say son of Mary? Well, the custom of the time was to identify sons by their fathers, not by their mothers. What you would expect to hear would be, oh, this is... This is son of the son of Joseph. And even if Joseph had already died, which tradition kind of leads us to believe that Joseph had died at this point, even if he were dead, you would still expect him to say, this is the son of Joseph. So why would they say son of Mary? Are they pointing to his virgin birth? Well, probably not. In fact, what they're probably doing is, is, is condemning him and showing contempt and that they believe that Jesus was the illegitimate son of Mary. This Mary who had a baby before she was even married. So you've, maybe you've heard the, the phrase, twisting the knife in the wound. Well, we started out with, is this just the carpenter? And oh, the carpenter of, a, of an illegitimate birth, twisting the knife in there. First, they claim that Jesus was unqualified, that he's just a carpenter. Next, they, they mock him as an illegitimate son born out of wedlock. Isn't he that carpenter, the son of that woman from that family? And it says they took offense. And this, this offense is not like so many people getting offended today and getting their feelings hurt. This is a little more serious than that. This is a, a scandalized kind of offense. They were, they were embarrassed and ashamed to be associated with Jesus. The same word is the word that is used in Psalm 118.22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That is the offense there. Or Isaiah 53.3. He was despised and rejected by men. By men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And to all this, this 
ridicule, this scoffing. Jesus responds with a Jewish proverb, and he says, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own household. And so I want to ask a question and want to express a concern. I want to begin with the question. The question stems from verse 5. Verse 5 says, right after Jesus gave this parable, he said, it, the, uh, Mark writes, and he could do no mighty work there. He could do no mighty work there. This kind of sends up a red flag, especially if you're, maybe if you're, you're like my kids and a song they've learned is, uh, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. This verse says, and he could do no mighty work there. What does this, what does this mean? It's, that's, the song that I know says that there is nothing my God cannot do. Jesus is God. His hands are not tied by the will of men. What does it mean that God could do no work there? Well, this is, this is one of those opportunities that I get as we preach through Scripture where I get to remind you or teach you about a principle of, in reading Scripture and understanding Scripture. You see, when we read the Bible, we must interpret Scripture in light of Scripture. One of the main principles of reading the Bible is context, context, context. Read Scripture in context. Don't take verses out of context. But this, right, but this here is another important principle. We must interpret Scripture in light of Scripture apply what we know about stuff from, from other places, places that are more clear, apply those things to places where, which are less clear. And so when the Bible says something that seems contradictory or inconsistent, we must stop and reconsider and evaluate what it means. You see, a book that claims to be truth, claims to be the Word of God, as, as of course the Bible does, it cannot contain untruths. As our Baptist faith and message states, the Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth, hear that, truth, without any mixture of error for its matter. And then there's a summary statement at the end. It says, therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. We believe that, don't we? All Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It is truth without any mixture of error. So the Bible does not contradict itself. And if it does, we can know uh, what to be If it does, we can't know what to believe. We certainly can't trust it if there's inconsistencies or contradictions in Scripture. We won't know what to believe, but, but it does not contain contradictions or untruths. The Bible shows us that God can do anything in accordance with His will, that He is omnipotent, all-powerful, and that He is unchanging. See, the fact that He is all-powerful will never change because He is unchanging. We we look at that from places like Genesis 18, 14, where, it's, where, where God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Or Jesus himself said in Matthew 19, 26, But with God, all things are possible. God can do anything that is consistent with his character, with his nature, and he refuses to do anything that would contradict or conflict with who he is. Now, with that in mind, there are things that God refuses to do, refuses to be, and in which case we could say that he cannot do those things. God is holy. Therefore, he cannot be unholy. God is just. Therefore, he cannot, he will not, he refuses to be unjust. God is righteous, perfectly righteous. And because he is righteous, and because he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he can never be unrighteous. That's something that God cannot do. 
Because those things violate who God is and, and are a contradiction of his character and who he is. And so what is going on in this passage? Well, it is not that Jesus' power is dependent upon humanity or that suddenly Jesus lost his power because of their lack of faith. Instead, what's going on here is this. It would be inconsistent for Jesus to perform mighty works among those who do not believe in him, among those who do not trust him. Where the kingdom of God is rejected, it is inappropriate for the king to share its new life and its new joy. So what was going on is that God is withholding his Holy Spirit in judgment against the people of Nazareth because of their disbelief. Because they disbelieved, he refused to do any mighty works among them. So it's a matter of two different perspectives with a could not and a would not. From man's perspective, could not expresses what's being seen. But from God's perspective, it is a would not. He would do no mighty work among them because of their lack of faith. Pastor and author, R.C. Sproul, who has gone on to be with the Lord now, wrote something regarding the Lord's Prayer in his book, The Holiness of God, that I think is really helpful for us to understand what's happening here in Nazareth. So as he's, he's writing this in relation to the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so he says this, there is, there is a kind of sequence in this prayer. As you think through the Lord's Prayer, there's a sequence there. And he writes, God's kingdom will never come where his name is not considered holy. His will is not done on earth as it is in heaven. If his name is desecrated here in heaven, the name of God is holy. It is breathed by angels in a sacred hush. Heaven is a place where reverence for God is total. And then he concludes it saying this, it is foolish to look for the kingdom of God anywhere God is not revered. It is foolish to look for the kingdom of God anywhere where God is not revered. Now, I believe there's application for us in this church. There's application for us here in the, the local church. And that we must never expect God's blessing and for his kingdom to advance where Christians mock the holiness of God and the gospel by living like the world, by living in unrepentant sin and living in ways that are contrary to the word of God and to the will of God. We can never expect the blessing of God and the kingdom to advance when that is the situation within the church. It's like a man who expects to have a, a wonderful marriage but yet has an ongoing affair going with another woman. It's just foolishness. And in fact, that's a more apt picture of the church than we'd like to admit sometimes because our sin is idolatry. Our sin is adultery. It is like we are that adulterous man whenever we chase after other things instead of the Lord. We are the bride of Christ and if we refuse to honor the Lord, whether in our individual lives or, or in the church corporately, we will not see the kingdom of God advance. We will not experience blessing in the church. When we cozy up with sin, we will not enjoy blessing. But the same is true not just in the church, but in our nation. The same truth applies. We must never expect God's blessing where his holiness is mocked. Shall we look for the blessing of God where the, where the name of God is, is ridiculed? As Bro writes, it is foolish to look for the kingdom anywhere where God is not revered. The truth of the matter is, our nation needs reform. And it needs a great many other things. But most of all, what our nation desperately needs is repentance and revival. It needs Jesus Christ. We need to see God as who he is. We need to see God as, as holy, to revere the name of God and to believe on him. Church, we have always been in a spiritual battle. 
That spiritual battle is more visible now than it's probably ever been in our lifetimes. At least it is and more so than I've ever seen in my life. And there are things we can do. And most certainly we must do our civic duty. We must get out and vote on Tuesday and again in November. But brothers and sisters, America needs God more than she needs Republicans or Democrats. And so we pray. We pray and we pray. And we pray some more. If this nation is to be turned around, we are dependent upon God to do it. But let me remind you of what was said in Genesis 18, 20, 18 14 again. Is anything too hard for God? So that addresses the question. The question of what does verse 5 mean, that he could do no mighty work there. The concern stems from verse 6. He marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus looked out across the people of Nazareth and he marveled at their unbelief. This is the concern, the danger of unbelief. Notice what happens next after this. He went about among the villages teaching. What does that mean? It means Jesus left. Jesus left. I can think of nothing more terrifying than to hear that. Jesus left. Having been rejected by his own people, having been ridiculed and mocked after teaching them, he took his ministry somewhere else. He left. It is possible for people to be exposed over and over again to the good news of Jesus Christ and yet continue to reject him and to refuse his message. And it is possible that the time will come when Jesus will leave you alone and he'll leave as he did the people in Nazareth that day. Have you been told about Jesus time and again, but yet say no to him? Do you, re do you remain in unbelief and refuse to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Let me tell you something about this Jesus. This Jesus saw your need. He saw that you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that you are without hope on your own, that you could never make yourself right before a holy God on yourself. He saw you guilty in your sin and destined for the judgment of God and in love said, I'm going to stand in their place. I'm going to bear the wrath of God for them. They deserve the condemnation of their sin. But Jesus said, I'm going to stand in their place. I'm going to bear the wrath of God for them. And as I do so, I will give them my righteousness. He paid a debt that we could never afford to give, give us a gift that we could never earn on our own. And that gift is a free gift of eternal life as we repent of our sin and trust in Christ for salvation. See, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The people of Nazareth they had so many advantages. They had seen Jesus grow up right before their eyes. For 30 years, they'd have been exposed to Jesus. But they were blind to his identity. They were deaf to his message. And they had hardened their hearts against him. One of the things that we'll find in the Gospel of Mark is that there is no record, at least in the Gospel of Mark, of Jesus ever returning to Nazareth again. And, you know, we have many advantages, too. We, we, have, we have not lived among the Word of God incarnate in our midst like they did in Nazareth 2,000 years ago. But, but we've got the Word of God in print. We've got it in our homes. Amazingly, 92% of Americans have a Bible, and the average American Christian has nine Bibles, according to the statistics I read the other day. You have access to the Bible. You have heard the gospel. You've sat in church services. You've been exposed to the good news of Jesus Christ. And, but I ask you are, you, are you still in disbelief? Have you yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you reject Jesus and his lordship in your life? The reality of our sin is that our sin is an offense to a holy God. 
And the greatest danger that we could ever face is to remain in our unbelief, to remain in unrepentance, for God to to walk away and to leave, for you to reach the end of your life and face the just consequence of your sin. So I urge you to learn. Learn from the people of Nazareth. Learn from the people of Nazareth. Don't, Don't harden your heart to him, but turn to him in faith and repentance. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for grace. Lord, I pray that for those where hardness of heart is is creeping in, with ongoing familiarity to the gospel, having heard of Jesus many times before, when I pray for those hearts that are starting to be hardened. Lord, we know that salvation is your work. It is you who saves. Lord, we pray that you would invade these hearts where hardness is creeping in, Lord, that you would soften them. You grant the gift of faith. Lord, if there be any here today who say, I've I've never trusted Christ as my Savior, I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that they would trust Jesus. And Lord, if there be any here today who, who would say, I've got sin that's standing in the way of the blessing of God. I've got sin that is is hindering my usefulness in the kingdom. I've got sin that is is hindering the progress of the gospel through our church. Lord, what a gift repentance is. I pray she would bring conviction and repentance. Lord, not only do we have the faith to believe that you are sent your son Jesus to die for our sins, but we in faith believe that that the grace that was applied at our conversion is a grace that will last. We it is a it is a grace that you will continue to pour out on us. Lord, we as followers of Jesus will continue to struggle with sin until the day you return. So Lord Help us to continually turn back to you, to seek grace, to seek repentance. That's an ongoing thing in the Christian life, repenting and believing. We repent of our sin and trust in you. Turn from our sin and trust in you. Lord, if there be any unrepentant sin that lingers in anyone here today, Lord, I pray that today be the day you give the grace to turn from that and lean on you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.